Hello, saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody out there is having a blessed day today. And for those of you who have been following the study chapter by chapter, verse by verse, God bless all of you. And my prayer in Christ Jesus is that your eyes have been opened and your understanding of right division has been increased. Saints, that's the whole purpose of this study. To edify you with wisdom, with knowledge, with understanding of God's word. Unto Christ Jesus be all the glory, the praise, and the honor forever and ever. Amen. Now, we're getting close or closer in finishing our study on the book of Acts. Acts is a transitional book, as you know. And what do I mean by transitional? Well, that, that's the second reason I did this study on the book of Acts. Because in order to understand division and dispensations and, and right division, you have to understand what's happening in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is, a, is a, the foundation to right division. And we know the book of Acts records 99% of Paul's ministry. The transition occurs when we see Peter's continuation of the kingdom program, Jesus' earthly ministry for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews, their kingdom program. And because Israel rejected Jesus, their Messiah, in fact, they rejected God three times, as we know. They reject the Father, they killed the Son, then they blaspheme and reject the Holy Spirit when they killed Stephen. So we see a transition from Israel's program over to the mystery program revealed to Paul. From kingdom to grace. From faith plus law to faith alone. Now the book of Acts is the foundation of who we are today in the body of Christ. That's why Acts is so important to understand. So important to study. And we know that Jesus came to usher in the earthly kingdom. Israel's promise their covenant and they rejected it and because they rejected Jesus our Messiah their Messiah God turned to Saul who we know as our Apostle Paul God gives Paul a new program this new program is called the dispensation of the grace of God or the administration of the grace of God and how do we know that look at Ephesians 3 verse 1 for this cause I Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit that the gentiles who the gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body what's his body the body of christ neither jew nor gentile one body and partakers of his promise in christ by the gospel whereof i was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power now it's extremely apparent that the four Gospels Peter's program and the end time books Hebrews through Revelation are contradictory to Paul's 13 books that's evident that's obvious now without understanding right division without realizing that there is a dispensation program the entire New Testament Testament will seem to contradict itself over and over again. It won't make any sense. James says the opposite from Paul. Paul says the opposite from John and Peter. It just doesn't flow too well without right division. But when your eyes are opened and you've been gifted with the ability to see right division and understand the different administrations or dispensations, then you'll understand God's word. Suddenly, there are no contradictions. Suddenly, it all makes sense. And I say that you've been gifted because I believe, I sincerely believe, it is a gift. It is a gift. Your eyes are open to understand right division and dispensation. It is a direct gift from God himself. And I believe that when you the the thing the, the most important thing that has to happen before someone is gifted with the ability to see right divisions and dispensations they the one ingredient that has to happen 
is that person has to humble themselves. As soon as they humble themselves and they stop relying on their own ability to understand God's word, they stop relying on dispensations and traditions of men to understand God's word. When they stop doing those things, they humble themselves and they turn to God and they beg him and they plead with him to teach him through the Holy Spirit. After all, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. That is scriptural. He is our teacher. He helps us understand all things spiritual. And like I said, the most important ingredient is to humble yourself. Then you are given the gift, the eyes to see, the ears to hear and understand right divisions, understand what dispensation is, and then you understand God's word clearly. The fact is, the four Gospels and the end time books are all about the dispensation of the kingdom. And Paul's 13 books are all about the dispensation of the grace of God. Two completely different programs for two different groups of people. And for two very different and specific periods of time. Okay, now continuing on in today's study. Now in our last study, Acts chapter 26, we saw Paul giving his testimony once again to King Agrippa II. Also in front of the governor, Festus, and everyone else who happened to witness Paul speaking. King Agrippa and Festus admit that they can't find fault with Paul. There's really nothing they can charge Paul with under the Roman law. And they would have set Paul free if it wasn't for Paul's appeal. But since Paul appealed to the emperor of Rome, the Roman law demands that Paul be taken to Rome to appeal in person before Caesar. And this is the fulfillment of what Jesus told Paul, that Paul would stand before the Romans in Rome to give his testimony before all men, a continuation of Paul's preaching of the gospel of grace. And we also, we also talked about a seeming contradiction between Acts 9-7 and Acts 22-9. And by studying and right division, we've discovered that there is no contradiction. When you look at, back at the original text, in the Greek, the word phone can mean a sound or a voice of someone speaking. It doesn't necessarily mean that they understood what was being said. And we saw that. And the people with Paul on the way to Damascus heard a voice but didn't understand what was being said. We also looked at Acts 26.20 and the meaning of the word repent and doing works meet for repentance. So that brings us to our next study, today's study, Acts chapter 27. And Paul has given his testimony over and over again before the people in Jerusalem and Caesarea. Both small and great have now heard about Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. Paul's mission is almost complete. Now it's time for Paul to be taken to Rome. Jesus told Paul that he would testify in Rome before all men. And during this time, take note that persecution is ramping up. And the majority of persecution isn't coming from the Gentiles, but from the Jews. The law-minded Jews are in conflict with the grace-minded body of Christ. It's this conflict that'll eventually get out of hand and cause the Gentiles, specifically the Romans, to attack the Jews and destroy the temple in 70 AD. This, this is just 10 years down the road at this point. So now in Acts 27, the Roman authority is transporting Paul to Rome to stand before Caesar. And we're going to be studying the specifics of Paul's journey, how God will protect Paul from all the problems that they're going to encounter while sailing to Rome. The year is late 59 AD, approximately in the month of October. And we begin our study in verse 1. And, it, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. Now, notice the word we. It's being used here once again, and we know what this means. It means that Luke, who the Holy Spirit wrote the book of Acts through, is traveling with Paul here. In verse 2, and entering into a ship of the Ad Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julia, Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. 
And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. Now, looking at the map on the screen, notice the orange dotted line. This is Paul's journey to Rome. They leave Caesarea, where Paul stood before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa II. They head north past Tyre, then to Sidon, north once again past Cyprus, then west to Myra. They continue west past Rhodes, then south towards Crete, which is called Fair Havens. Now, leaving Fair Havens, they once again head west, eventually landing on some islands called Melita, also known as Malta. Then they head north to Syracuse up again to the north, eventually arriving in a place called Three Taverns. And up north is Rome, where Paul will stand before the Emperor Caesar. So back to the beginning of Paul's journey, it took around two weeks for Paul to travel from Caesarea to Myra because the winds were not cooperating that well. And that's the reason why they went around Cyprus to the north instead of passing it on the south side of the island because the winds were too bad and when they got to Myra <clears throat> they changed ship and the ship they boarded is filled with wheat and, and different grains from Egypt on its way to Rome the majority of the grain came from Egypt back in those days in verse 7 and when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce were come over against Nidus the wind not suffering us we sailed under Crete over against Salmon and hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the fair haven now whereunto was the city of lycia now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed paul admonished them now the ship couldn't sail directly to italy because of the strong winds this huge storm they reached the harbor to wait out the storm trying to get to rome as quickly as possible because it was getting late in the year and back then they didn't travel too much on the sea during the winter months because it was just too dangerous and in verse 9 Luke records that it was just after Yom Kippur and we know Yom Kippur and back in 59 AD was in the month of October so that gives us an idea of the season that this is taking place in like I said just before winter so they don't have much time left to sail in verse 10 and said unto them sirs I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage not only of the lading of the ship but also of our lives nevertheless the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul and because the haven was not commodious to winter in the more part advised to depart thence also if by any means they might attain to Venice and there to winter which is in haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest the men on the ship had to make a quick decision because the fair havens was a very bad very dangerous place to stay for winter but because paul had a lot of experience traveling in these areas he tries to convince the captain to stay in fair havens to let the storm pass instead we see the captain ignore paul's advice and he decides to sail regardless of the storm probably because they had to deliver all the grain they had uh, from egypt on time verse 13 and when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous, a tempestuous wind called Eurycleidion. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat which when they had taken up they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands strake sail and so were driven and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest and the next day they lightened the ship and the third day we came out with our own hands the tackling of the ship and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us all hope that we should be saved was then 
taken away. So the ship and crew get a get hit with a surprise storm. They load the rescue boat onto the ship. They tie everything down aboard and the strong winds are taking them southwest to an area near North Africa where there's a huge sandbar where many ships had been destroyed over the years. So to avoid hitting this sandbar, they lighten the ship. They try to make the ship less heavy by throwing everything over into the sea, including a lot of the grain from Egypt. Also, because of the storm, they couldn't use the sun or the moon or the stars for navigation. So they're basically steering blind at this point, and they're all scared to death, probably thinking that they're all about to die. In verse 21, but after long abstinence, Paul took forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Now, at this point, everyone thought that they were going to die, but our Apostle Paul knew better. Paul knew that he would get to Rome safe and sound because Jesus told him that he would. So Paul's not as worried as the rest of the crew is at this point. Also, the angel of God tells Paul that not only would he make it to Rome, but God would protect everyone on the ship and none of them would perish, even after crashing on an island, all of them would be spared. So we see Paul speaking to almost 300 men, encouraging them and testifying of the power of our Lord Jesus telling them that God would not allow anyone to die. In verse 27, But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded, they measured the depth, and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and found it fifteen fathoms. So they're getting closer to a land mass at this point. In verse 29, Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under Kohler, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Now, it's in the middle of the night here. They can't see anything. It's pitch black. But they know the water is getting shallow and more shallow and more shallow. So they fear crashing ashore at this point. The sailors were scared. They, they wanted to bail ship. And they pretend to drop the anchors. But instead, secretly, they prepare the lifeboats to escape the coming disaster. And Paul tells Julius about what the men are planning in secret. And Julius orders the soldiers to cut the lifeboat's ropes. And the lifeboats are now useless to anyone, forcing them to stay on the ship. Julius the centurion makes it impossible for anyone to escape. Paul knew that they had to stay together. The angel of God told Paul that they would all survive just as long as they stayed with Paul. Verse 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, in other words, to eat food, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, some food, for this is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat, food. And we went, and we were in all in the ship, two hundred, three score, and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. Now, Paul tells everyone to eat some food, getting strength for what's about to happen. 
Okay, Paul knows that the ship is about to be destroyed. And after eating, they throw the leftovers overboard, making the ship less heavy. And here, we're given an exact number of the men aboard the ship. A total of 276 men. And there has to be something significant with this number 276 for some reason. And if anybody knows the significance of 276, please share it with me. I'd like to know. In verse 39, And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore, into the which they were minded, if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and hoist up the mainsail to the wind, and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, Julius, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest who can't swim, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. The ship hits a sandbar, and they're all in big trouble at this point, but they know land has to be very close. And at this point, the ship is breaking apart, so they have to bail, whether they like it or not. Julius is worried that the prisoners are going to escape, and if they do, that means Julius is head. He'd be killed for losing the prisoners. The soldiers recommend killing all the prisoners, including Paul, so they can't escape. But Julius overrules their idea. He doesn't want Paul to die, and he tells everyone to bail ship and get to shore. As God promises Paul, not one person drowns, and everyone makes it to shore safe and sound. A perfect example of the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. All we have to do is believe and trust Him, and all will be well. His promises will be fulfilled every single time. Now, that concludes our study on Acts 27. Unto Christ Jesus be with you, and all the glory and praise goes to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord willing, I'll see you for our last chapter in the book of Acts, chapter 28.